Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And welcome to the Associates of the Boston Public Library's 100-Year Retroactive Book Award for 1923. I am Al yes, that we I am Alice Lee, Chair of the Associates of the Boston Public Library. The Associates is an independent nonprofit that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the historic, literary, and artistic treasures of the Boston Public Library. And we do that through targeted grant making and cultural events. By expanding access to these collections, the Associates ensures that present and future generations in Boston and beyond continue to be informed and inspired. The Associates funds critical, con con excuse me, critical conservation projects and nine vital full-time library staff positions to catalog, to digitize, to conserve, and to curate the BPL's rare books, manuscripts, prints, photographs, musical scores, works of art, and other items in the special collections. The books championed during the 100-year retroactive book award are often represented within the BPL's rare book collection. The BPL holds a rare 1926 edition of Khalil Gibran, Gibran's The Prophet. It's illustrated with original drawings by the author, and we also have a 1929 edition of Felix Salton's Bambi, translated by Whitaker Chambers and illustrated by Kurt Weiss. Members of the public can make appointment to access these volumes in the newly renovated Special Collections Reading Room. Tonight, we ask those of you sitting in our audience and those participating virtually from home to turn back the clock 100 years and join us for the penultimate debate about which books have had an enduring impact on our society and stand the test of time. I hope that you will enjoy the lively discussion and exercise your right to vote for the best book of 1923. <laughs> I love applause for voting. Very. Before I introduce our moderator, I need to thank everyone who makes this event possible. I would like to recognize the 100 year retroactive book award committee chair and associates board member, Lisa Fagan Davis. Lisa, she's right there. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment to this event and to the associates. Tonight, I'd also like to rec recognize my fellow executive committee member and associates vice chair, Bill Martin, who is in the audience. Thank you, Bill. And um, I would also like to recognize my predecessor because he's in the room tonight and I just think he's awesome. Um, our former board chairman, who many of you may know, Peter Brown is also with us this evening. Thank you, Peter. And now let's see, before we go any further, I wanna make sure we get some of the business out of the way. I Just a few housekeeping matters. First of all, you should know there is no intermission tonight. And we ask you to please turn off your cell phone so that we don't in, uh, disturb the uh, performance, the show this evening. And we cannot allow any eating or drinking in Rab Hall. You may have seen the sign that said water is permitted, but no other eating or drinking. Photography and videography during the show is prohibited. And for the men, the bathrooms are up the stairs and straight back. For the women, our bathroom is broken. So sadly, you will need to go downstairs to the bathroom on the first floor. What's, yeah, we always have to work harder, it's true. Um, and, and finally, in case of an emergency, please find the nearest exit to leave the building and you might wanna just look for that right now. And now it's my honor to introduce Kennedy Elsie, our moderator for the evening. Kennedy is the co-host of the popular morning radio program, 
Carson and Kennedy on Mix 104.1, where they make us laugh and cry all in one morning, as well as being an ardent supporter of the associates of the Boston Public Library, Kennedy is involved in many important community organizations and programs, such as Carson and Kennedy's Cool Kids and Your Light is Needed fundraiser. She also serves on the board of Samaritans, helping raise awareness of, a port of important mental health issues. We are very honored to have Kennedy with us tonight. Ken Thank you so much for that kind introduction. My friends, I'm so honored to be here tonight. Again, my name is Kennedy. I work in radio. No business being here, but I'm just beyond beyond that I get to do something inside the Boston Public Library. I, uh, I love libraries. My mother uh, was a big proponent of reading and books. She read us the entire Chronicles of Narnia during breakfast when I was in grade school. Um, and she took me to see my first opera, Macbeth. Little heady, little long for an 11-year-old, but... Um, we checked out the record at our public library uh, so I could have the libretto so I could know what they were saying. And she has always given me that gift and I'm so grateful. And when I moved to Boston and I got to walk into this incredible building, it was, it was very magical. This place holds very special memories for me and I'm just so honored to be sitting inside of it today. So thank you guys. I'm not an author, a critic, an academic, nothing. I make people laugh for a living. So we're gonna have fun tonight. So I'm gonna bring up some things here about 1923 just to set the stage for you. And there's some jokes in here and you can laugh. And if it's not funny, laugh anyway. <laughs> so what can we say about 1923? It doesn't really sound like a hundred years ago. I still think the nineties were like 10 years ago, but much has changed, much has stayed the same. Prime example, Red Sox finished dead last in their division in 1923 and they finished dead last in their division this year. But we love them. We do. Um, 1923 brought us some interesting things. And I hate to mention the Yankees, but Yankee Stadium opened 11 years after Fenway. It's no big deal. During the first historic game, Babe Ruth hit a three-run homer to de defeat our beloved Red Sox. The photo on the screen shows Babe Ruth shaking President Harding's hand a few years later at Yankee Stadium. And on February 16th, 1923, English archaeologist Howard Carter opened the inner burial chamber of the ancient Egyptian ruler King Tutankhamun's tomb and found the sarcophagus. It uh, gave us new insights about Egypt and led to a really great song by Steve Martin in 1985. <laughs> Boston Airport opened. It was a military base first. Did you know that? I didn't. It was for the Massachusetts State Guard and the Army Air Corps. It was known as Jeffrey Field and the Sumner Tunnel was still closed on weekends. The very first issue of Time Magazine was published during March. Um, it has given us everything, news, politics, health, entertainment, and now gives us a person of the year every year that makes us scratch our heads. Some of my personal favorites, The Feminine Mystique, The Computer, and You. Remember that one? <laughs> 1923 brought us Norman Mailer, Chuck Yeager, boxy, boxer Rocky Marciano, Hank Williams, and Charlton Heston, who perhaps gave us one of the most quotable quotes from any movie ever. The Disney Brothers created the Walt Disney Company, which brought us wonderful animation and incredibly overpriced tickets for their parks. And finally, Warner Brothers Studio opened. They brought us movies like Casablanca, Rebel Without a Cause, Streetcar Named Desire, and that very underrated Dukes of Hazard remake. It also gave us the three books that we are going to discuss today. So let's get to it and why we're here. It is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's 1923 presenters. Maria Tatar will defend Felix Salton's Bambi, A Life in the Woods. She is the John L. Loeb Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures and Chair of the Committee on Degrees in Folklore and Mythology at Harvard University. Her expertise lies in children's literature, German literature, and folklore. Recent works include The Heroine with 1001 Faces and The Annotated Peter Pan, which commemorates 100 years of J.M. Barrie's novel, Peter and Wendy. She has also written books about Weimar culture, Weimar culture, yeah, The Brothers Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, and Childhood Reading. She is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Ratcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Maria has also written for the New York Times, the New Republic, and the Harvard Crimson, if you please. Her work has been featured on the Today Show and in Harvard Magazine. Maria, please, thank you so much. 
Oh, well, thank you for inviting me to present on Bambi and thank you to all of you. Thanks to you for being here tonight. Uh, I think I'm going to be the only one in this trio who is going to issue a trigger warning. And uh, I mean that some of you have figured out, you've guessed that I, I mean that in a very literal, literal way. Uh, Bambi, uh, are you shuddering when you hear, hear the sound of that name? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, grew up with the 1942 Disney film. And you know about that shot heard around the world, that moment when Bambi's mother, uh, Bambi's mother is killed by a trigger happy hunter. So who's not traumatized by that scene? Uh, Keep running, she shouts to Bambi, she cries out. Then the shot and Bambi's plaintive cry, I rewatch this and it is heart-wrenching. Uh, we made it, mother, 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 where are you? So I actually could add additional trigger warnings uh, about the violence and misogyny in the novel, in the novel that I'm going to be talking about by Felix Salton, which is clearly very much a book for adults and not for children. Uh, but first, just a reminder that I'm here for Salton, for Felix Salton's novel, not for the Disney film, which by the way, grossed about $300 million. Um, Salton was paid about $1,000 for the rights to the film, which um, at that time, uh, it was 1933, it still wasn't a lot of money. By the way, that may be all the more reason to give Salton the award. Uh, so, uh, so let me turn from Disney's Bambi to Salton's Bambi. Uh, and this is a book that is really an allegory along the lines of something like Animal Farm. Uh, Bambi is a book that reminds us that animals are good to think with. As the famous French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, told us, it was recently retranslated by Jack Sipes, who saw in it a parable about the inhumane treatment of minorities in a world that was turning fascist. Uh, and more specifically, Zipes believes that Salton was evoking the plight of European Jews. And what we have in the book is really an allegory of anti-Semitism, with the deer in the forest debating whether humans who have guns and power will stop persecuting us. So that is one message and a really powerful one. But what I wanna to do tonight is to run the dogs in a different direction. And instead of looking forward and thinking about how the novel anticipates uh, certain political movements and catastrophes, I wanna look backward and argue that Bambi is really a work that um, that goes backward in time and that works hard to process the trauma of the First World War. So it's addressed to a generation that was taught that it's sweet and proper to die for your country. Uh, if you know Latin, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. And that's what the Latin poet Homer was telling entire generations of schoolboys in Germany and in Austria. So it's 1923 and we're just five years away from the armistice. And we're about nine years away from the guns of August when the shots are first uh, fired. When uh, we have the beginning of a war that is being fought with horrifying new technologies, heavy artillery, tanks, aircraft, machine guns, poison gas that's delivered with shells and mortars. Uh, all this is fought in uh, trenches. This, the, the battles are all fought in trenches. And the horrors of trench warfare have actually been uh, captured in many contemporary films. I don't know whether you've seen uh, Peter Jackson's They Will Not Grow Old, which gives us documentary footage, newly discovered documentary footage. And there's Sam Mendes's 1917, uh, a film that 
is just two continuous takes so that you feel you're really in the trenches with the soldiers. And then of course the reboot of All Quiet on the Western Front recently. So in Bambi, in Bambi there are many wounded creatures. Um, at times, the book really does read like a war novel. And here's a rabbit dying in the fields. Can you help me a little, she said. Bambi looked at her and shuddered. Her hind leg dangled lifelessly in the snow, dyeing it red and melting it with warm oozing blood. Can you help me a little, she repeated. She spoke as if she were well and whole, almost as if she were happy. I don't know what happened to me, she went on. There's really no sense to it, but I just can't seem to walk. And that incredible, there's really no sense to it. And in the middle of her words, in the middle of her speech, she rolls over on her side and dies. So I think this passage really captures the brutal re realities of trench warfare. Soldiers in shock on the battlefield, near death, as they're still unaware that they have lost a limb uh, and are mortally wounded. So World War I was a war in which uh, you weren't going to win glory and, and uh, immortality on the battlefield. You were not going to be Achilles or Hector. And instead, you're going to end up as a rotting corpse lying in the mud, uh, basically providing nourishment for the rats who are in the trenches, who are swarming in the, in the trenches. So Bambi, as you've uh, heard, as you figured out now, is a dark and enigmatic text, not for children at all. It's littered with corpses. Uh, at one point, Bambi sees, uh, this is life in the forest, and Bambi sees a human body, a dead body in the woods. And he's told he's lying there dead. He's just the same as we are. He has the same fears, the same needs, and suffers in the same way. He lies helpless on the ground like the rest of us. So Salton's novel really engages with our anxieties about mortality, our need to find meaning and to make sense of the world. And it also transmits a powerful anti-war message. It tells us about the senselessness of war and how war makes it a challenge to find any meaning in life at all. You can see why the Nazis banned the book. Um, it was resolutely pacifist uh, with its many passages describing violence, mutilation, death, and decay. And I think it's a book that also must have resonated in terrible ways with veterans, uh, with war veterans, who basically realized that their sacrifices were all in vain. So Salton's novel takes us into the woods, into the forest, uh, not just to nature red in tooth and claw, but also to the savagery of wars conducted by humans. And as I was rereading Bambi, it slowly dawned on me that animals are actually terrifying to think with. Good to think with as well, in a sense, uh, but terrifying because they are our curved mirrors and they reflect back a distorted and exaggerated version of who we are. We may be at the top of the food chain, but we're vulnerable, exposed, and sadly, often bent on survival more than anything else. So why Bambi? I'll make my case in brief, in a nutshell. Uh, this is a landmark work of pacifism. It's only thinly disguised, and once you read it with an awareness of World War I, things uh, change dramatically. It's also an eco-narrative before its time. And the book itself is a survivor. It survived the Nazi banning and burning in the 1930s, and on a more trivial level, it, it survived Disneyfication in the 1940s. And so I, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, half, I'm comforted to know that Felix Salton is now getting, today he's getting the recognition uh, he so richly deserves. So thank you to the associates um, of the library. Uh, thank you for including him in this uh, distinguished trio. 
and to the audience. I hope you'll give Salt in your vote uh, this evening, but if not, I'm completely thrilled that his work is being honored today as part of this trio. Thank you. Tough stuff, but you still made us laugh three times, so that's a gift. <laughs> All right, next up, I would love to introduce you to Paul Wright. He will defend Khalil Gibran's profit. He is a book historian, a freelance writer, and an editor who is currently coordinating a South Bend oral history project funded by the American Historical Association for the South Bend Historical Society and the UMass Boston Archives. Paul also serves on the board of the South End Historical Society and is writing a book on the Harvard classics. He was the editor of the UMass Press from 1988 to 2006, where he started as a production and acquisitions editor. He was also executive editor of the book series, Studies in Print and Culture and the History of the Book from 1994 to 2006, sponsoring editor of the book series, American Popular Music from 2001 to 2006. Please welcome Paul Wright. I want to first thank the Associates of the Library, you, you hear me all right, for uh, inviting me to uh, speak on behalf of Khalil Gibran's book, The Prophet. I have one here. This is one I bought in 1976. I think all of you probably have one hidden somewhere in your libraries. Uh, I'm fortunate that much of the work in support of The Prophet was, has already been done. And a prima facie case for its importance has already been made. In her eulogy for Queen Elizabeth II just last September, the Bishop of London, the Right Reverend Sarah Mullally, spoke the following words, quote, we may not know the power of that love for departed until the moment of loss. For as writer Khalil Gibran wisely observed, love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. It should not come as a surprise that with the vast liturgical literature of the Anglican Church and the enormous resources of English literature at her disposal, the Bishop of London had, had recourse, as have thousands of others, to these words from a Lebanese Amer Arabic speaker whose second language was English. On countless occasions of recognition and celebration, funerals, baptisms, weddings, graduations, the prophet comes to mind and to hand as the perfect text for the moment. Of course, the Bishop of London is not alone in her regard for the prophet. No less a personage than Eleanor Roosevelt in her My Day newspaper column in December 1936 quoted the book in her holiday message. Quote, you give little, but when you give of your possessions, it is when you give of yourself that you truly give. Leonard Cohen, the late singer-songwriter weighed in, on, in an interview. Khalil Gibran, he said, speaks to millions of people and the things he say, says are true. And the Beatles and Bob Dylan and countless others acknowledge the influence of the prophet. Elvis Presley was known as a constant reader and annotator of the book. But it is just not the rich, the rich and famous who responded to the prophet. During World War II, the Council on Books in Wartime published compact paperbacked armed services editions of classic books for distribution, free to soldiers and sailors overseas. These were extremely popular among the troops and the prophet was one of the most popular. No doubt that that wartime exposure stimulated post-war interest. How do we begin to understand this remarkable literary and cultural phenomenon? The answer lies in part in the biography of the man, in part in the publishing business in the early 20th century, and in part in the audience that bought the book in not thousands, but millions of copies over the last 100 years, not only in English, but internationally in more than 40 translations. Let us turn back to the city of Boston at the end of the 19th century as a key to the life and career of Khalil Gibran. Indeed, a case can be made that the prophet is as much a Boston book where the author was shaped 
as a New York book where it was edited and published, or as a Lebanese book where it has its roots. Everything I say tonight about Gibran's time in Boston is carefully detailed in successive editions of Jean and the late Khalil Gibran's definitive biography of the artist and poet, the latest revision of which, Khalil Gibran, Beyond Borders, was published in 2017. And I'm very pleased that Jean is here tonight with us. Gibran emigrated with his mother and siblings at age 12 to Boston in 1895 from the small town of Bashari on the slopes of Mount Lebanon. He was a precocious lad, physically attractive with latent artistic gifts and native intelligence. He found refuge from the hurly-burly of the streets at Denison House, one of the great settlement houses established in Boston to aid the immigrant population and help them assimilate into American life. There he came to the attention of Boston Brahmin patrons who fostered his education and nurtured his talents. He learned English, notably under the tutelage of benevolent women, and he was taken up by Fred Holland Day, an early practitioner of soft focus photography as a fine art. Through Day, he was introduced as an apprentice to the world of publishing and graphic design at Day's firm of Copeland and Day, a Boston publishing house in the William Morris tradition. As much an artist as a poet, Gibran never forgot the potent combination of graphic arts and printed words that helped him years later to shape the appearance of the prophet. It was also through Day that the adolescent met poet Josephine Preston Peabody. Their friendship inspired her to write a poem entitled The Prophet about a young artist whom she called a young Ravi Gilga. Her title, having haunted Gibran for years, became the final choice for his major work that in first drafts was the Commonwealth or Councils. Another Boston patron, Mary Haskell, would become his lifelong friend, literary advisor, and collaborative editor as, moved, as he moved the prophet from Arabic drafts to, to English finals. Gibran went off to Paris in 1908 to study painting. There he was introduced, among others, to the art and writing of William Blake, an important influence on his aesthetic and approach and the mystical writings of Morris Medelink an influence on his thought. His distinctive, fluid, self, soft rendering style was shaped by his teachers in Paris and exposure to their art and perhaps influenced by Day's photographic practices. He returned to Boston briefly in 1912, but attracted as were so many before and after him by the gravi gravitational pull of the big city, he moved to the Bohe Bohemian art, artistic and literary communities of New York. It should be noted that in New York, he was a key part of a flourishing group of expatriated Arabic writers and journalists who were laboring to reform Arabic literature and culture, bringing it into the modern world. Much of his Arabic writing remains untranslated and unknown in America, but is a main source of his fame in the Arabic world. He is credited, credited for example, with introducing the short story genres to Arabic audiences. Gibran was fortunate to come to New York just as the great period of 20th century American trade book publishing was taking off. Essential players in the movement were Alfred Knopf and his writer, wife and editor, Blanche, who were famed for their publication of many modernist classics and for the excellence of their editorial design, typographical and production values. Alfred claimed not to understand Gibran's work, although he published earlier books, and gladly published the profit at a handsome profit. But Bl that's my one joke. For <laughs> that's my one joke for tonight. But Blanche is the one who reportedly established a symp sympathetic relationship with the author. Gibran, drawing on his youthful, youthful experience with Copeland and Day, was involved with every aspect of the book's production, from the original design and layout to the execu execution of the illustrations to the preparation of the plates, to the binding, stamping, and jacketing. The list of companies associated with the first edition reads like a who's who of high, qual high quality 1920s trade book publication, including printing and binding by the famous Plimpton Press in Norwood, Massachusetts. The Knopf edition became an unexpected and enduring success. According to reports, it sold and a, quote, astonishing 1,300 copies in the first weeks. 
A notice in the Chicago Evening Post lauded it as, quote, a little Bible for those, quote, ready to see the truth. And the beat went on. It is reported that the first edition sold out in two months, 13,000 copies a year were sold during the Great Depression, 60,000 in 1944, and one million by 1957. The latest research in Knopf archives reliably indicates that more than nine million copies of it have been published to date in various printings and resettings. <clears throat> it is well known that Gibran bequeathed the valuable copyright of the prophet to his hometown of Bashari in Lebanon, where he is, in, where he is interred. In 2019, the copyright to the prophet expired and it became part of the public domain. Publishers other than Gnopf rushed to bring out their own editions. Most notably, most notably, it was adopted as part of the Penguin Classic series, a sort of literary canonization. The prestige of writing the foreword to the new, this new edition went to Rupi Kaur, an immensely popular young Punjabi Canadian poet who, like Gibran, learned English as a second language. Uh, Rupi's entire piece is, an exceptional, uh, is exceptional and worth reading in its entirety. She tells of her working class Sikh father who often sang and recited works from his native language, turning to the prophet, presumably in translation, and quote, those moments when his words could not express the weight of what he had endured. He allowed Khalil Gibran's the prophet to do the talking. Rupi recounts how in a time of stress, she later came up upon an open book face down on a library table. Quote, I picked it up where the last reader had le left off and read, your joy is sorrow and mask. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow and others say, nay, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come and once, when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed. Rupi returns, uh, these, must have, these have been the most grounding words of my life. I remember everything shifting in me when I read them. I think that what I am trying to say is this. This book cracked my heart wide open, and I think it is going to the new, do the same to yours. Let me finish by suggesting that as you leave the library this evening, exit through the Dartmouth Street doors. Directly across the street, you will find a modest but striking memorial to Khalil Gibran, featuring a fine bas-relief portrait of, by his godson and bar, biographer, in which the poet is shown holding a copy of the prophet. On the memorial are inscribed the following words. Quote, Khalil Gibran, a native of Bashari, Lebanon, found literary and artistic sustenance in the Denison House Settlement, the Boston Public Schools, and the Boston Public Library. He actually uh, visited this building when it was first opened in 1895 and often was here reading. A grateful city acknowledges the greater harmony among men and strength and universality of spirit given by Khalil Gibran to the people of the world in return. It could not be better said. Thank you for your, for your interest and attention. Prophet made a profit. <laughs> it was a perfect joke. I had a joke and it's not that good. So I'm going to leave it in the ether because it was perfect. Finally, I would love to introduce you to Julie Henricus. She will defend Agatha Christie's Murder on the Links. She is the author of 10 mystery novels, including the Clock Shop Mystery Series and the Garden Squad Mysteries. Her most recent release, The Plot Thickens, is the fifth Garden Squad Mystery set in fictional Goosebush, Goose Massachusetts. Her short stories have been published in the Thin Ice Anthology, Dead Calm, and Blood Moon. Julie was recently named the Executive Director of Sisters in Crime, the national association that advocates for women writers of crime novels, and also hosts the weekly Sisters in Crime Writers podcast. She has taught at Emerson and Boston College and was the Executive Director of Stage Source, theater artist and company service organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julie. Good evening. I am delighted to be here tonight to defend Agatha Christie and the Murder on the Links. The Murder on the Links 
This is not an original um, copy, and you'll notice when they talked about special collections, Mrs. Christie isn't in there with the murder on the links, but I'm going to explain why she should be in all, everyone's special collections. The Murder on the Links was Agatha Christie's third book. Her journey from writer to published author began in 1920 with the publication of The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which introduced the world to Hercule Poirot, a Belgian detective and refugee. Perot became her most famous character, but hardly her only character. Altogether, she wrote 75 novels, 28 collections, which included 165 short stories, <clears throat> three books of poetry, 16 plays, seven radio broadcast words, works, <clears throat> and two autobiographies. Agatha Christie's career is formed around her exploration of style, of form, and of characters. She was born in the middle class of England in 1890, an Edwardian era. Like so many others of her generation, Maria's talked about this, she was also part of World War I. During the war, she was married, but her husband was in Europe, so she was living on her own, and that's when she started writing The Mysterious Affair at Styles. She volunteered in hospitals and eventually started working in the dispensary, which is where she learned so much about poisons, which she learned, uses a great deal in her novels. I think 100 years later, it's really difficult to understand the impact of World War I on people, their relationships, and their life choices over the next decades. The Murder on the Links is, was dedicated to her husband, Archie Christie. Agatha and her husband definitely had challenges um, post-World War I with finances, trying to maintain their middle-class lifestyle, which is one of the reasons she took up writing. <clears throat> but given the chance to tour around the world for Archie's job, <clears throat> sorry, they, they jumped on it and they went. Life was to be lived and chances were to be taken. Agatha is herself put aside her horrific experiences in the hospital and didn't really talk about them later, but she did um, was affected by them later on in life. Archie, like so many others of his generation, was affected very emotionally and couldn't handle people being um, upset or, or uncertain um, or emotionally unstable. And since Agatha did suffer from depression in the 1920s, their marriage suffered and it did not survive the decade. She recreated her first detective stories in the Sherlock Holmes, John Watson method, which is a, with a first person unreliable narrator. In Perot's examples, it's Captain Hastings, um, following around after a great detective, seeing but not seeing what the great detective sees. Hercule Perot is short, he's got a bald egg-shaped head, he has big, huge mustaches he's very proud of. He's fussy about his appearance, his food, his home, and his life. He relies on his little gray cells to, to help him create order out of chaos. He looks at the psychology of people to help him solve mysteries. The challenge for Agatha Christie's reputation is that by many, she is considered a mid-brow writer in a world that lifts up high-brow writers. I do not think she would disagree that she wrote to please her reading public, though she did not pander to them. She was very pragmatic as she went forward in her career and wrote plays. She wrote short stories, detective novels, thrillers, romances under the name Mary Westmacott, standalones and series. In 1928, after her divorce, writing became the way she supported herself and her daughter. She had grown up with financial concerns, and that is partially what drove her. But she was also driven by the desire to write and to write well. The Murder on the Links shows that she avoided the sophomore slump many writers suffer with their second book featuring a strong character, thus ensuring Hercule Poirot's longevity. She keeps the mystery fresh by bringing Poirot and Hastings to France because someone wrote Poirot a letter asking for help. When he and Hastings arrive, the letter writer has been murdered. So Perrault has two mysteries to solve. One, who killed Paul Renault? The second, what was Renault worried about? Perrault discovers that the case is nearly identical to one from 22 years ago, and in fact, has many of the same characters involved. 
The past influencing the present is a plot device she uses a few other times, including in Murder on the Orient Express in 1931. One of the other interesting choices she makes in The Murder on the Links is to compare Perot with a younger detective who spends time crawling around the crime scene and looking for clues. Hastings is fascinated with this young detective, but Perot thinks he's wasting his time. He reminds everyone that he is the greatest detective in the world by using his little gray cells and shows it by the end of the book. Perot is interesting because he's so egotistical and yet such a great character driven by kindness and justice that his egotism is forgiven. As a writer, Christie had become aware by the reception of this book and by the fact that she had been asked to write a dozen short stories featuring Hercule Perot that he was going to be part of her life moving forward. In later years, she says that she would wish she created him younger and a little bit different because he does grate on her nerves at times. <laughs> but the public can't get enough of him. She does decide at the end of the murder on the links to marry Captain Hastings off and send him to Argentina. She says in her autobiography that she knew she was stuck with Perot and didn't want to be stuck with Hastings as well. <laughs> That choice as a writer freed her up to write her third Perot novel, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which uses the Holmes-Watson narrative method brilliantly. Agatha Christie started her writing career in 1920, and it continued through 1975. She died in 1976. Perot stars in 33 novels, 59 short stories, and one original full-length play. After the last Perot book, Curtain, was published, the character got a front page obituary in the New York Times. It's hard to underestimate how popular her writing was and continues to be. She has sold over one billion books in English and over one billion books in other languages. Agatha Christie is often neglected when talking about great writers of the last century, but in recent years, her work has been reevaluated for its value, not only in entertainment, but in literature. That reevaluation is well deserved. Not only has she given millions of people hours of pleasure, but she's brought the detective novel forward with her use of characters, point of view, plotting, and commentary on society. She constantly challenged herself to write differently, to write better, to explore, and to entertain. I am delighted to talk to you about the murder on the links today and to sing the praises of Agatha Christie always. Thank you so much. Isn't that just the way you've got to keep the man around even though he grates on your last nerve? I don't work with anybody like that. I'm kidding. So thank you, champions. Let's give them a round of applause, yes? So now on to the debate. What is the best book of 1923? For those of you with questions in the audience, just raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. Don't be shy. We're all friends here. And um, uh, you can, if you're in the virtual world, use the Q&A button and your questions will be right here for everybody to hear. And while we take questions, you can always vote while you're sitting there using the QR code and instructions inside your program booklet. And if you're having a hard time with that, just raise your hands, we'll help you. So who's got a question? I have a question. Is it on? Hello? I don't need a mic. Oh. <laughs> no, it's is it working? Oh, go. yes, it is. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Lisa. I have a question for you, Maria. Is there anything in um, Salton's background that helps us unpack the metaphorical aspects of Bambi? Oh, that helps us unpack the metaphorical aspects of this? Oh, well, you know, ironically, he was actually a, a hunter uh, and a passionate hunter. Uh, so, you know, it's odd to think of him then writing uh, a novel that features animals and how they're constantly under threat from uh, a figure who is described as him, he, him, always capitalized. So humans are kind of godlike in that context. So uh, what else in his background? I mean, I think that the hunting thing uh, sort of, 
presents a paradox and a, a real puzzle. How do you resolve those? And, and Jack Zipes tries to explain some of that in the preface to his translation of, um, of Bambi. So that's a start, and uh, there may be, may be other features uh, that, um, that we can talk about in the next, in the few minutes left to us. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank yeah. you. Who else? Here we go. Hi, my name is Betsy. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Uh, Julie, I have a question about Agatha Christie with her b -b billions of books. What was her age when she started to experience huge success, and how did she live? I don't feel like I know much about her at all. Um, her first books, The uh, Mysterious Affair at Styles, was well received and did well. But her first contract, and many uh, early writers will understand this, she didn't have an agent and it wasn't well negotiated. So she had a five book contract and didn't really understand what her royalties were and she'd get them haphazardly and not a lot of, um, of checks. But then she started to, they serialized her books and she started to get bigger advances. She signed with an agent. Um, uh, the Murder of Roger or Ackroyd was the next one. Um, and oh, the first one on the end side with Houghton Mifflin, and that they were her um, publishers for the rest of her life. Um, so she had success right out of the gate, but it really picked up um, as the short stories were coming. And by 1926, when the murder of Roger Ackroyd was published, she was um, she was a star. But she she had pretty early success. Thank you. I think we have one online. Yeah, is this on? It's yes, on. Excellent. Uh, another question for Julie. One of our online participants asks how the Miss Marple books can compare to the period. I can't Perot. say Perot. Perot. Thank you. Stories. Um, are they as important? Um, Agatha Christie wrote Hercule Perrault and Jane Marple are her best known uh, detectives, but she also wrote a lot of standalones, including, and then there were none. Um, Parker Pine is another one. Haley, um, Haley Quinn. She, she, has a lot of different um, characters in her repertoire. Jane Marple is an important um, sleuth. She is sort of a Jessica Fletcher type. She's older. She lives in St. Mary Mead. Um, she solves crimes by knowing everybody's business and knowing people who are like the people who committed the crime. So, oh, cousin Andy married somebody who is as terrible as his wife and, you know, uh, whatever. So Jane Marple is important. She, there was actually a collection of short stories inspired by Jane Marple, just um, released last year. Um, and her first book is in 1930, uh, The Body in the Library, which is also a, a pretty great book and on a lot of bookshelves. Thank you. Just a reminder to vote. If you haven't voted, make sure you do the QR code and vote. Do we have another question from the audience up here? Someone is coming to you with a microphone. Take one and pass it down. <laughs> Just like it's a hot dog at Red Sox. Hi, everyone. My name is Mujia. Um, this is sort of a meta level question, but each of you have noted the popularity of the books and how much it's sold or um, not, or have not and have not received much loyalty. But I'm curious, you know, books are so personal and our preferences for reading, whatever, whatever genre it is, is incredibly subjective but I, I love to hear from all three of you what makes a book good if it's not popularity. Who wants to start there? Mm. <laughs> what, what makes Bambi powerful? Uh, well, I would say, first of all, uh, you know, as I said, animals are good to think with and going into the forest and listening, eavesdropping on these animals is truly extraordinary. And then, you know, our brains start, I, I said animals are good to think with, our brains start working and we begin to think, how do humans act? You know, how, how do these, how do we compare with the animals? Are we still very much like them or have we evolved in some ways? So to me, it's just, you know, exhilarating to read it because you, are reading, sort of like having bifocal vision. You're thinking about the animals in the forest, but also about humans and how they, how they operate. And uh, I, I want to backtrack for just a second. 
but I think this will connect with what you said earlier, uh, the richness of the tapestry that is woven. So I mentioned that you know Salton was a hunter. I didn't say the obvious thing, which is that Salton was also Jewish, and he was wor you know he was anxious. He was living in a society where there was anti-Semitism. So there's a great deal of. Um, of uh, discourse in the novel about uh, the perils of him, of, of those, those hunters. So somehow to me, it seems that, you know, it's a simple story. It's about animals. It's been turned into a Disney film and all of that. And yet when you read it as an adult, when you read the work, uh, you read it in a way that is very different from the way that Walt Disney read it. And you see all of these different different layers. And, and so I find, you know, I've read it three times now. And the third time was the most exciting because you begin to see new things. Yeah. Uh, I'm, your question was what makes any book good or this particular book? This particular book. Oh. Uh, I think it's, it, it's an uh, interesting book to have been published in 1923, post World War I, uh, which we've been talking about, and the, the horrors of the war uh, generated a lot of uh, uh, cynicism. A lot of uh, uh, modernist irony, a lot of absurd, absurdist uh, and uh, uh, despairing approaches to the world. This book doesn't fit that mold of modernist literature, although it was published by one of the great modernist publishers. But what it does do is, is uh, offer a kind of uh, example of what I guess you'd call uh, wisdom literature. Where, uh, and it has a, a sort of archetypal framework where a prophet, the chosen one, visits us for a while, imparts his, his or her wisdom, and then leaves. I mean, you can see that in the Christ story or in, I'm sure, other religious uh, uh, um, uh, stories. So I think that, that it comes at a moment where people wanted some kind of comfort and it, it, it comes at a moment in people's lives when they are, are uh, often in a period of uh, uh, emotional uh, arousal or excitement because of a, a, a significant event in their lives, their lives and their family. And one finds in the book and a text that will fit into that moment. So. I, I think that's part of the, the, the reason it's been so popular and uh, popular generation after generation for, the, for, for that simple reason that it's a, a, a comforting text. Can I just interject? Yeah. I mean, I've got the existential despair in Bambi and all the perils, and you have the antidote. Right. The spiritual comfort. And, <laughs> and uh, as far as I. the wrong book. Uh, World War II, World War One, you know, the great it's the great yeah. breaking point in Western culture, and uh, for for Gibran it meant uh, liberation of Lebanon from the heel of the Ottoman Empire, and it uh, must have affected him in ways that I don't understand or know very well. I'm sure Jean could speak eloquently to how the war affected him, but he uh, he definitely had a uh, offered his text as an antidote, I guess you could say. So Agatha Christie and her books, and The Murder and the Lynx um, being one of them, offers a different sort of respite for readers. Um, she writes books that are puzzle books in her detective series. Um, all the clues are laid out for the reader, and the reader is promised that at the end, justice will be restored, chaos will be dampened down. Justice can take place in a lot of different ways, um, but, and that all the clues are laid out. And I think that the role that Agatha Christie books play is in a world that was really upside down and so difficult for so many people. They could have a respite and have somebody who can, can make, make chaos go away for a while. And they can engage the readers. And her characters um, are broadly drawn and some people criticize her for that. But she draws characters that everyone knew. Everyone knew somebody who had shell shock. Everyone knew somebody who had been um, a nurse in a hospital. Everyone knew somebody who lost a fiance in the war. 
And so those feelings that come up with those characters, the reader can interject what they think that character is going to be. And by interjecting, they jump to um, guesses about things and motivations, and that's how she tricks you as a reader. So um, she's working on a few different levels there, um, but, but it's very effective. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Do we have one out here? Because we have one online if we don't. Yeah? Here? Hi, I'm Bill Nygreen. Uh, Julie, I have a question. You made a powerful case for Agatha Christie. Are there a few things you could say about why that particular book, Murder on the Links, deserves our vote? Sure. Uh, you know, it is the second Perot mystery book, and it does develop him more as a character, helps him stand on his own, um, gets rid of Captain Hastings <laughs> by getting him married off to, um, to, and going to Argentina, though he does come back um, for visits. Um, it is the first time from according to a Jeopardy question, um, the scene of a crime was ever mentioned in a book, so there's some significance there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also a, uh, she's exploring and, and with Perot what else she can do with it and expanding her writing. So it has a French flavor because they're in France and sort of lets the reader know that they're going to go on journeys with him, which, which indicates where he's going to be going in the future. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So are you ready to hear the winner? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah. All right, there we are, there we are. Thank you again, all three of you, for being here today. What an interesting discussion. How so much fun. So, without further ado, the 100 Year Retroactive Book Award of 1923 is The Prophet. Congratulations, Paul. <laughs> Paul isn't going home empty handed. We have a gift certificate to the Harvard Bookstore. <laughs> Again, thank you all so much. Is Alice coming back up to say you are? Come on up, girl. Again, my name is Kennedy. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be with you guys tonight. I had such a great time. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations. Of course, it was my pleasure. <laughs> well, that was a ton of fun. Thank you all very much. Before we, um, before we divide up, a very direct personal thank you to each and every one of you. Kennedy, you brought joy throughout the night. Thank you. And um, Maria and Paul and Julie, thank you so much for participating with us this evening um, and educating us on these incredible authors and their books from 1923. We're really grateful to your being here with us this evening. And to our virtual audience, Thank you for joining us remotely. For those of you who are here in Rab Hall, we invite you to join us for a reception to celebrate our 1923 winner. The reception is going to be in the Newsfeed Cafe, and it's located on the first floor to the left of the information desk. Please show your program book, and that will be your ticket to get into the cafe. Um, your ticket for admittance. Have a wonderful evening and thank you all again.